Okay. Good evening. Uh, very thankful for those of you that have chosen to join us tonight at our first of three town hall meetings where we really have two objectives that we hope to accomplish. Number one is to update you on some of the fantastic work that really began with our board of trustees as far back as 2015 and show you a timeline of events that has occurred that shows that that hard work is still happening and the momentum is uh, continuing to build each day. Uh, we're not trying to claim that we've arrived or suggest that we're done or finished in any kind of way, but I can assure you that uh, we're confident that the uh, ways that we have organized ourselves will help us improve student achievement, um, definitely see levels of student progress, and the bottom line is, is that, as you've heard me mention, uh, hopefully uh, several times, in our district we have an achievement gap. And there's lots of reasons for that gap. But the bottom line is, is that it's not right for kids. And the curriculum that we claim, uh, boldly proclaim, um, uh, is viable and it is for every kid. It's not just for some kids. It's regardless of where they come from, regardless of their backgrounds, we really believe that we have an instructional system in place uh, that answers the question, how do we know that kids are learning what they're supposed to learn? Uh, I have several special guests in the audience, too many to really name, but I do want to thank everyone for taking uh, time out of your schedule to join us. Uh, one very special guest, uh, she, she's certainly no stranger to Waco High School, having two boys graduate from here, top of their class. Uh, she's the former mayor of the city of Waco, and last year she served as assistant superintendent of student services in the Waco Independent School District, but for the past seven or eight months. Uh, she has been serving as the chief executive officer of our in-district charter system, and she's done an outstanding job. Please help me welcome the CEO of the Transformation Zone, Dr. Robin McDurham. Uh, also, we have the vice president of our board of trustees, Gentleman who needs no introduction as well, one of the leaders, part of the leadership team at Extraco Banks. And um, I would say he's also known as being the husband of Miss Jane. <laughs> but please help me welcome Mr. Alan Sykes. And our co-presenter for this evening, who is going to take us through our first few slides and really um, tell the story from a point where I wasn't even on the radar. Uh, 2015 is where uh, our journey tonight will begin. Uh, he is the president of the Board of Trustees, a 20 year, 18? Anyways, he's been on the board a long time. Uh, his uh, three children all graduated uh, from Waco High School, as did Mr. Sykes, um, boys. Uh, please help me welcome the president of the Waco Independent School District Board of Trustees, Mr. Pat Atkins. Good evening. As Dr. Nelson said, uh, there are really two, two purposes tonight. I've got the boring, looking backwards, bunch of heavy number intensive part of it. And then I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Nelson, and he's going to get to talk about all the exciting things we're going to do looking forward. Uh, so to begin, uh, we would go back to uh, the tax ratification election, uh, which occurred uh, three years ago this week, uh, in 2015. And a couple of things uh, to remind you of about uh, the TRE at the time we presented it to the community. Uh, we represented to this community that uh, this plan would include specific goals with measurable outcomes that we would report out to the community every year. 
And that's part of uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting, is to give you an update on where those dollars went. Uh, we also told the community uh, that the initiatives that we put in place were all campus driven. That every one of the initiatives we came up with were based upon conversations and feedback and input from our campus staff in terms of what were the critical needs in Waco ISD at that time. One of the other representations we made that we've held uh, firm to is every dollar raised by that tax ratification election went to the campuses. It was not used to create any additional positions downtown, but rather it did create positions on campuses all across this community. And as a result of having the election passed, we were able to create over 200 jobs in the Waco community on our campuses working with our young people. Uh, and so I want to highlight uh, sort of what were some of the things that we talked about doing and then give you a specific update uh, on the, the goals we set. As I said, we identified based on input from our, our faculty and staff on campus three critical areas that needed to be addressed. Uh, first, we needed to expand opportunities of our students to earn dual credit. Uh, second, we needed to increase our literacy rates. And third, we recognized that we had to do more in the area of behavior and discipline in the district without it going in the area of, we were looking at non-punitive ways to address behavior. Uh, and so we set up specific goals in each of those areas. Uh, the first, uh, on the idea of dual credit opportunities, that TRE uh, and the additional dollars that were raised allowed us to create a program in partnership with MCC and TSTC where every junior and senior uh, at Waco High and University High could take every dual credit course they wanted to uh, at no cost to their family. We'd be able to pick up tuition, books, fees, and everything so that they could earn those dual credit and begin to occur, accrue college credits while still enrolled in high school. Uh, there was a column in the paper over the weekend that gave some of these numbers, but also highlighted some of the individual successes. Uh, there was a young lady who graduated from Waco High in May, actually earned her associate's degree at MCC two weeks before graduating from Waco High School and accomplished all of that by the end of her junior year. It took her three years, in part because of the investment you made in allowing her family to earn all those, uh, allow her to be able to earn those college credits at no cost to her family. We had another young lady at University High School who earned her associate's degree from MTC, actually on the first day of class this year, Waco ISD, she had completed her associate's degree. So here's what we said we were gonna do. The goal was that by the year 2020, we would have 325 Waco ISD students uh, earning uh, and taking dual credit classes at MCC. And this was primarily on the academic, uh, not the, the career path at PSTC. And at the time, uh, we were at 215. As you can see, uh, as of last year, or this year, uh, we're not only above where we thought we would be this year, we have already uh, well surpassed where we thought we would be by 2020. Uh, that the work of our counselors uh, and the campus staff and our students, frankly, and their families, along with the investment you've made, has made this possible to where we've now got far more students participating, even more than we had originally anticipated, and, and we've already exceeded the goal that we told you we would hit. The second piece of the TRE focused on literacy. Uh, sure, you can ask questions while we're going through it. Yeah, it's a, no. Uh, the current school funding formulas, what were used to, to do this. Uh, obviously there was a lawsuit pending at the time where a number of districts, including Waco ISD, had sued the Texas Education Agency and the legislature saying those formulas uh, didn't meet the mandates of the Texas Constitution. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court said that in fact, although they were flawed, they were constitutionally sufficient. And so there doesn't appear to be any plan in the immediate future to change those formulas. And as long as that law is in place, these funds continue to come to Waco ISD. 
And part of, of what I think is important to note is although we passed uh, the TRE here locally, out of the $8.9 million we raised last year, more than $3.5 million came from Austin. Uh, and so over the last three years, we've actually brought into this community about $10 million uh, that we would have left on the table down in Austin had we not done this. And those dollars will continue to come forward uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, it's always possible the legislature might change those uh, formulas and the way they fund public schools and use a different uh, tax base to do so, but there's no indication they're going to do that in the near future. That's it. Right, we can see those continue to go forward, continue to pride and fund these initiatives. It's a great question. Uh, the second piece focused on literacy, and we hired additional uh, middle school reading teachers, but the real focus was on third grade. Because you all recall when uh, Virginia Dupuy was doing the Education Alliance, one of the things they identified was if a student was not on grade level uh, by third grade reading, that for every year, they, or every two years they matriculated through the system beyond that, they fell another year behind. Uh, and so it was critical that we get these kids on grade level by third grade. And so the investment we asked you to make was that we put a high quality instructional aid in every pre-K class across the district, every kindergarten class across the district, and in first and second grade, we have one aid for every two, two classrooms. Uh, and you can see from where we started uh, two years ago at 54%, we've gone up to 61% or 62%, I can't read that. Uh, but we're still not where we wanna be in literacy, uh, and we acknowledge that. Uh, and one of the things I, I think Dr. Nelson's going to talk about is over the past year, our curriculum and instruction staff have met with stakeholders and experts and really developed uh, a, a new literacy plan that will use new technology and new practices that's going to allow us to leverage this investment in staff to where we're going to get, we believe, to uh, even higher reading rates. Now, I will also tell you we may have been little overly aggressive on our goal. Uh, what we asked for originally and what we projected uh, and hoped to reach was an 83% passing rate by the year 2020. Uh, as you know, we have a high percentage of economically disadvantaged students in Waco ISD. Uh, for the most recent reporting period, about over 85% of our students were economically disadvantaged. That compares to about 59% across the state, okay? And so we're dealing with a more challenging population across the state. I tell you that because last year on the STAR test, uh, across the entire state of Texas, only 76% of the students uh, passed the third grade reading STAR test. Uh, and so we've now set a goal that's actually higher uh, than the state of Texas in terms of the percentage of students who are gonna pass. Uh, and that may have been overly aggressive, to be candid about it. But we do anticipate the trend to continue to go upward, and the administration asked if we wanted to revisit that goal, and the board last month said, no, we want to continue to, to set high goals, and if we come up short, uh, that's fine, but we don't want to roll that goal back. This is what we projected and told the community was our goal, we're going to continue to keep that goal in place, but I want you to know that is a goal that's about seven percentage points higher than even the entire state of Texas. Um, with, with a much more challenging population. Um, the last piece of the TRE uh, dealt with discipline and behavior. And there were really two components there. We know that there are students who sometimes when they're acting out uh, don't need to go into uh, a, a discipline program or a punitive program. Sometimes they just need a place where they can get refocused uh, and have and continue to receive instruction without being disruptive. And that was the other piece of it. One thing we heard from teachers was if I've got 22 students in my charge and just one or two are acting out on a bad day, the time I'm spending with those one or two are taking away from the time that I can be teaching the other 20. And so we set up on every campus a reset classroom. And so that child, when they're having a bad day, uh, we'll have an opportunity to continue to receive instruction because the teacher in the reset classroom has the lesson plans that are in the regular classroom. Uh, but they're also receiving a guidance on how to better respond to certain uh, stimulus and, and also sometimes just 
uh, refocus and calm down a little bit because something agitated them that morning. Uh, and as you can see, uh, that coupled with the behavior aids and a number of other things that we have done has taken our number of uh, out of school suspensions uh, from 43 back in 2015 all the way down to 21 this year, a reduction of over 51%. Uh, and so we're continuing to make progress also in the area of uh, classroom disruptions and discipline. Uh, and so that's what we did in 2015. Uh, and we asked uh, this community to make the investment. Almost 60% of voters approved that. Uh, and we wanted to show you the progress we're making and that we are in fact spending the dollars exactly where we said we would. A year later, uh, in 2016, actually two years ago this week, uh, the TEA came to the Wake ISD Board of Trustees and asked us to go through a governance training called Lone Star Governance. Uh, and we went through a weekend long training over at Region 12 with the Deputy Commissioner of TEA, A.J. Craybill, and then went through a number of follow-up sessions uh, on Saturday mornings where we began to develop very specific goals. Lone Star Governance is nothing more than a continuous improvement model where the board focuses its effort on these three goals and, with, and on goal progress measures underneath each of those where we can make sure that as a district, we're making progress towards those goals. Uh, and so we wanted to give you an update on sort of what those goals were and where we are in that process. Uh, and some of them are gonna look very familiar to what we just looked at and what we told the community we were gonna do uh, on the uh, tax ratification election. Uh, the first goal actually tracks perfectly the language from the TRE, and that is uh, having, taking the number of students passing the third grade reading test from 54 to 83%. Uh, now, to ensure that we're making progress on that, there are progress measures that the administration reports back to the board. We have a calendar where we get a different report every month where they look at certain grade levels and our reading screeners to make sure that we're making the progress we want to make. And as we said, uh, we're not there yet on literacy. Not sure we're going to hit 83% uh, because, as I said, it's a higher goal than uh, for the entire state of Texas. But we continue to monitor that. Uh, the second goal, uh, tied very closely to our dual credit initiative as part of the TRE, and that was that we would increase the number of students uh, with at least 12 hours of post-secondary credit uh, from 5.9 to 20 percent by the end of next year and every uh, progress measure again indicates that we're making satisfactory progress on that goal. Uh, the third part of the TRE you remember was behavior and, and discipline and we got into an interesting discussion with Deputy Commissioner Craybill on whether behavior is a quote student outcome which is what TEA wanted us to focus on and it was clear that TEA's position was that's sort of a, a means to the outcome that as you improve student behavior, you're going to get better outcomes. They didn't consider that an outcome in and of itself. And so we couldn't use behavior as our third goal under Lone Star Governance. Uh, but we did take, give some serious thought to the purpose of public education. You know, and, and part of this governance included a vision, and Mr. Sykes actually took the lead on wordsmithing it. What we came up with was Wake OSD will provide students an educational foundation for lifelong success. I tell you that because when you talk about a, a foundation for lifelong success, we know that not all our students are going to pursue uh, a four-year academic degree once they graduate. But there are a number of students that are going to go to work in the local community uh, and through programs like Guama and Guaca. It, it's part of our charge to ensure we're meeting the needs of those students as well. And so our third goal focused on those students and said we would increase the percentage of graduates displaying career readiness uh, to 80% by next year. And when we began to review these goals last month, what we found was through the work of Donna McKethan and her staff, uh, we've already met this goal. We're done. And so the question was under this TEA model, do we have to continue to get reports on a goal that we've already satisfied? And what they've told us is no. Uh, that in fact we can take that goal and anticipate next month the board will adopt a new goal, still in the area of career readiness, but we're going to talk more about uh, the percentage of students identified as career ready under the college career military readiness criteria of TEA. 
Uh, and so this third goal will be changed next month, but we'll still focus on uh, career readiness for our students who may not be pursuing that four-year academic degree. As I said, my part of this was kind of numbers intensive. Uh, I will tell you uh, that we will have a link up on the WISD website that will give you everything we've done in the area of Lone Star governance in terms of the specific goals, the progress measures we're looking at. We actually adopted uh, constraints on things the district and the board will not do in trying to reach those goals. And all that will be on the website, an opportunity for you to provide feedback or comments if you want to on any of those items. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Nelson to look at some of the initiatives we're going to be moving forward with in the coming years. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. I appreciate the, the leadership that this um, honorable board of trustees has provided, uh, not only since 2015, but several years before that. Uh, speaking of board of trustees, we had an additional member of our team join us. Uh, she is Mrs. Angela Tekel. Please help us recognize Ms. Tekel. And uh, one of the things I would say to, to finish the presentation, you know, is uh, when I arrived um, approximately June of 2017, the first day of school was August the 17th. I don't know if it's the first day of school or not, but I got a letter from the Texas Education Agency. I know for a fact it's dated August 17, 2017 and 17 because it kind of shook my whole existence. Um, I've, I had been here approximately 60 days. We were starting school and the letter was from Commissioner Mike Morath and it said, welcome to Waco. We're excited of the work that you're gonna do. In May of 2018, we'll be closing approximately 20% of your schools. And uh, I don't know if you understand how our budget works. Uh, that's basically unacceptable. That would have been 300 teachers would have been laid off. Another 300 staff would have been laid off. And it was because uh, five of our campuses were deemed chronically low performing, according to the Texas Education Agency. And so it was a tough task. Uh, several of the people sitting here, uh, we all came to the table and the first thing we said we needed to do was our board said we need to go tell the community about this situation. And that's what we did. So it was about a year ago that uh, we called for some town hall meetings and we explained the situation. And those meetings were heated and intense. There was a lot of finger pointing a lot of um, reasons offered uh, for the situation our school district is in. But I'm so proud of our board of trustees and every employee we have in the district because we rolled up our sleeves and we developed a plan to save our schools. This board could have easily voted to close those schools. This board could have easily decided to succumb to uh, local charter movements which let me be very clear, uh, we have nothing negative to say about competition. The Waco Independent School District, our kids, our staff, we welcome competition. Whether it's football or math achievement or how many kids getting into Baylor or whatever you want to compete. Uh, we believe that in addition to teaching our kids a very sound curriculum, we teach them a hidden curriculum. And it's things like teamwork, appreciation for hard work, and to be competitive. We call it grit, resiliency. And all these things are taught uh, in our curriculum by design. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember what the next slide is, if you want to go. <laughs> Is that the bow tie? So you have a document. It's kind of hard to see up there, but you should have a copy of it right here. And we have some people who can, if you don't have one, if you'll raise your hand, we'll get you one. If you can bring me one real quick. Bring a few. So we call this the bow tie. Thank you, sir. 
And I see the bow tie real clear. <laughs> but I've looked at this a couple thousand times. Um, this is another way to look at this as a framework for the things that we're trying to do in the district. You know, people ask all the time, you're, you're gonna hear some of the academic successes we've had over the past year, and the question comes up is, how'd you do that? And I wanna be clear, we're being asked that by dozens and dozens of school districts. Uh, true story, chairman, former chairman of the Public Education Committee in the House of Representatives, chairman Jimmy Don Acock from Colleen, I believe, or Belton, or somewhere here in Central Texas, uh, served as the chairman of the Public Ed Committee, came and spoke at the Waco Business League a couple of weeks ago, and I quote, he said it was unbelievable the academic successes that had happened in Waco ISD over the past year. Uh, <coughs> The list goes on and on and others. We have Commissioner Mike Morath who will be here, I believe this week or next. Uh, and I know that in his public presentations, I've heard him twice mention the transformation that is occurring in the unique partnerships. He calls them innovative partnerships that we have really worked with our community um, to develop and in an attempt to save our schools. But for us, it all focuses on a framework for learning. Some people would call it a strategic plan. Now, when I say strategic plan, I've done a strategic plan before where we had a consultant, and they come in and they ask people like you, what do you want for your schools? And then they do stakeholder groups throughout the community for six months. And then they synthesize all that to a report that is voted on. And then from that vote, a vision statement is developed and a mission statement and objectives. And with all due respect to those, to uh, the organizations that um, have that kind of time, that's not where we were at. We had nine months from the time we got the letter from TEA and it was like, look, if the schools don't make it next spring, they're closed. And what's so beautiful about this is that the Texas Education Agency felt like they were creating urgency that didn't exist. I'm here to tell you, when I got hired, the night I walked into the interview, that whole conversation was what are we going to do to address chronically low performing campuses, which I'm proud to say I had come from a district that had been through the same type of threat from state takeover. So I had some natural uh, experiences. And one of the things I knew that we were gonna need is a plan, a system, a set of non-negotiables that everyone agrees to. And even to this day, I'll call people into my office and we'll believe, we'll say, I'll say, do we believe these kids can learn? And I ask it like it's a question I'm not sure of the answer. Let me be clear, I already know the answer. Every kid we have, we really, really believe that each of them can and will learn. And I could take you through a two hour presentation but we really want to make sure we save some time to hear from you. But the most important part of this document is right in the middle of it. And it's a busy looking document to me. It has goals on it and call to action. It's got instructional objectives and all kinds of things that, trust me, anyone that is a teacher or above in our organization can tell you this is a framework for what we want for every kid. But the main thing our community needs to know is that the Waco Independent School District is a learning organization. It's like a tree. And that tree is a living tree. 
It's always growing. It's always developing. And really, as we call it a tree, we concentrate our leadership on three critical areas. Reflection, feedback, and analysis. We're trying to create a culture in our school systems where everyone values feedback. It starts with my relationship with the board. We have systems put in place where there's no surprises. We have conversations about my performance, about the district's performance, about student outcomes regularly, monthly. And I can assure you that is transferred to every campus principal that we have. And now we're asking our principals to create a culture where walking into classrooms is not seen as this event. We're asking everyone to observe teaching, observe instruction, have conversations about the leaves on the tree. Because for those leaves, that's somebody's child. That's somebody's family. And we feel like as long as we're watering the tree, as long as we're graduating some leaves, so to speak, that we'll create this system that perpetuates itself into future generations. Feedback, analysis, reflection. What's next, bro? Sorry. So, we're not going to go into all of this, but for me, as we talk to the, to the public, the first thing we wanted to talk about is the TRE and how we have been faithful to the investment that our taxpayers have given to this school district. And we will continue to be fervent, aggressive. You know, uh, the president of the board, Mr. Atkins, talked about the literacy goal of 83%. My curriculum team was like, uh, the state is at 76. So before we go to 83, <laughs> We might want to get to at least 76. And there's some truth to that. But the message from the Board of Trustees is real clear. This is critical and urgent business. And not that there's a hierarchy of things on here, but to set up our conversation with the community, to set up feedback in a town hall meeting, I would point you to the right page of this document, I guess that'd be left if you're looking at it. At the top, it says inputs. And right below input, what does it say, Mr. Clifton? Right above that. Five bold changes. Man, we could not be more excited about these five tenants. We believe that these things will spur student outcome improvement in a way that is rapid, that is quick. And you'll see at the end of this presentation, this is the work that we've been focusing on, and we got the results to say to our community, we are on the right track. A focus on early childhood education. See, for us, there's got to be a quick fix and that's to get the schools off the list. And we've been working on that every day, before school, after school. You're gonna hear about some stuff we're doing in the summer, you're gonna hear about some stuff we're gonna do during spring break, and the list goes on and on and on. Of us trying to fix the kids that are in third grade today. The kids that are in sixth grade today. But the ultimate solution to our our challenges is to prepare every kid we're responsible for for kindergarten. If we can have every kid walking into kindergarten on grade level, knowing their numbers and their letters, being ready to learn. For those of you that are not uh, in education as a profession, let me say it this way. If we could just have kids ready for kindergarten, 
that strategy alone would change all of our student outcomes by itself. Over 50% of our kids come to kindergarten now not ready for kindergarten. And that achievement gap often widens over time. The second bold change that we're most proud of, we could spend another hour on, is a 152-page comprehensive literacy plan. This literacy plan that was developed by our, really coordinated by our Office of Curriculum and Instruction, involved input from students, teachers, parents, and a host of other stakeholders. This 152-page document talks about literacy for every three-year-old we have, all the way to how do we help our parents who are functionally illiterate. We have hundreds, by the way, that would say, come to us all the time and say, I just want to help my kid, but I need help getting my own GED. I need help with literacy myself. Our plan, we're proud to report, offers adult literacy classes. Along with what we're doing for three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds. Uh, it's really a very exhaustive plan that it calls for uh, what we call double blocking reading in some of our grade levels. Where kids get two hours of reading. Whereas in other schools they may only get one hour. Because we feel like literacy is this gateway to every other discipline that we want to teach. So you have a literacy plan. We'll talk more about it. We just introduced it to our board. As we said, it's 152 pages. And it requires everything from budget adjustments to master schedule changes to, to collaborations with MCC. And the list goes on and on. Enhanced special programs. For us, we feel like the special programs that we have as a school district are some of the things that make our kids special. It's some of the best things about our kids, whether they're involved with our special education program, or our gifted and talented program, or our career and technical education program, bilingual, ESL, extracurriculars, band, athletics. For us, our special programs is what makes the magic. And a lot of times you hear us spend most of our time talking about things like literacy, math, social studies, science. And don't get me wrong, they're clearly a priority. But every time we talk about those things, we also want to talk about the special programs that are unique to each kid. And we have a long way to go there. I'm not sure how many of you are parents of children in our special education program. But we had to receive corrective action where we were forced to clean up some things in our special education program. And we're proud to report that we've done all of those 37 state mandated corrective actions. We're not completely done, but we're on the right track. And moving to where our special education program is just as popular as Atlas. In case you didn't know about Atlas, Atlas is one of the best programs in our state. We receive calls from all over the state of Texas for people wanting to be a part of Atlas and people wanting to know more about Lake Air Montessori. <laughs> and we're proud of those programs. And we want to be just as proud of our career and technical program, just as proud of our bilingual program as we are of our GT program. Blended learning. Uh, one, another seven-figure commitment by our Board of Trustees is for our kids and our staff to have access to the latest and greatest that technology has to offer. You know, some of the things that we're asking our teachers to, get, to do is take a fifth grader that's reading on a second grade level, and we're saying to that elementary principal, that fifth grader that's reading on a second grade level, needs to be le reading on a fifth grade level by the time they leave your elementary school. So they got to jump three grade levels in one year. And our principals have been responsive. 
But it's only because there's state-of-the-art technology now that kids are able to go home and work on uh, technology platforms that allow them to spend more time working on the content. And so we have programs now. We have a, a, a program, a six-figure program called Achieve 3000. And it's basically, to make a long story short, it helps kids work on their literacy skills 24 hours a day, seven days a week, wherever they can get internet access. And we have kids that are using it all the time. We have other programs, Accelerated Reader, uh, things like that that are under our blended learning umbrella. We're challenging our teachers to be more creative in how they embrace technology. Uh, as a parent, you should be able to access your school through social media. You should, have, you should be able to learn about your teachers, your child's teachers, through our website. And we're not where we want to be with blended learning because really, to be quite candid, uh, I'm an old school guy and I'm having to, to find the funds to support long term. You, you mentioned earlier about sustainability. You know, if I buy a laptop today, basically in about four years, I have to look at recouping or replacing uh, that laptop with a brand new one. But we're committed to it. The final of our, our big bold changes, big rocks is what we call them, is what we, we got the term from Prosper Waco, it's called coordinating wraparound services. You know, as Mr. Atkins said earlier, over 85% of our kids are economically disadvantaged. And that, my friends, can never be an excuse to allow dismal student achievement. As a matter of fact, the fact that 85% of our kids may come from poverty, all the more reason we should have a curriculum that is guaranteed and viable for every kid. Now, for some of our kids, what they need in order to be successful is a pair of glasses. And we've already tried in this district, with all due respect, we've given eye exams for years. <laughs> but for some of our kids, it doesn't do them any good if you give them an eye exam and you tell them, you know what, you need glasses. If you don't give them a voucher to go get those glasses, oh no, people are trying to pay their rent. We even found you can give them a voucher if you don't facilitate that conversation with an ophthalmologist where the kid gets to choose what color frames he or she wants and match it up with their prescription and hand them a pair of glasses, it may not happen. I'm so proud to report that Transformation Waco, Prosper Waco, we're already doing those things this very semester. We're already highlighting kids who are putting on their glasses for the first time and almost coming to tears, looking at things like trees, leaves on trees, clouds in the sky. And see, we don't think about those things because for us, that's a given. If you're squinting and your mama or your daddy see you squinting, they're going to take care of you. For some of you parents, you're going to take care of your kids. But we got a group of kids that Dr. McDurham uh, Dr. Polk, Prosper Waco, Transformation Waco have had to put a system in place where we actually go pick the kids up, take them to the ophthalmologist, take them back to get their frames picked, and then send the glasses over to the school. Now I'm proud of, of our team for coordinating that type of wraparound service. It's getting cold. Some of you don't think about this. We got kids that need coats. Food insecurity. I know you can't tell it from looking at me, but I happen to know a little bit about food insecurity. Not for the last 20 years, but as a child, it's hard to think about what you want to be when you grow up, when you're hungry. We're creating food pantries. We're expanding our Backpack of Hope program. Uh, we've got mentors 
my Rotarian brothers here. We've got mentors. Over 1,600 people are in our schools right now. Last year, at this time last year, we had a little under 1,000. This year, we're at 1,600 and growing every week. We can't, we can't background check people fast enough because people are wanting to come in and read to our kids. And I really applaud uh, programs like Prosper Waco. Our board president wears two hats, for the record. He is not only president of the Waco ISD board, he's also chairman of the board of directors for Prosper Waco. The executive director, Dr. Matthew Polk, uh, one of their newest directors who is here, uh, Pastor Brian Dalco. Mr. Dalco, let him see who you are. And uh, also another member of the Prosper Waco Board of Directors, Mr. Bill Clifton is here. Um, and there's some partnerships happening. I'm so happy to see my friends from Baylor here because they are putting hundreds of Baylor students in our schools every day. And I'm not just talking about the School of Education. I mean, we love Dr. Terrell Saxon. And we love uh, the School of Education. They are awesome partners. And we're trying to hire every teacher that's graduating from there today. But having said that, because of Ashley and Ramona and others, uh, we got we got social work majors coming in, math majors, kids in the Greek fraternities and sororities, and all of these uh, mentors are committing to helping our kids read, helping our literacy efforts. So I could go on and on, but let's just say that Dr. McDurham's uh, reorganization under Transformation Waco, it has been a, an a catalyst for really igniting wraparound services, wraparound services in a way that's unprecedented. And I know I speak for her, the best is just beginning. We're gonna do more. <clears throat> we believe that if we can have more time with our kids, they can be successful. So you're gonna see things over the next few months where for our kids that are our, our most needy students, uh, we're going to try and work with them over spring break. We're going to try and have them come to school a little bit early, stay a little bit later, all so that we can provide them a curriculum that is focused on the interventions that they need to be successful. We really want to triple the number of Waco ISD students that are attending Guama and Waka. We're actually adding, we have Guama, which is an advanced manufacturing academy. You can weld, you can learn to build a house. Uh, the list goes on and on. We also have Guaca at the old Viking Hills Elementary where you can pursue a health-related profession. And because of the leadership of our secondary education department, we're now creating a Guanca. <laughs> a lot of acronyms in WISD. But it is basically for networking and cybersecurity, where we're going to uh, basically develop our country's future cybersecurity professionals. So we're excited about that. We're creating an ag program. Can you believe Waco ISD? We have Extraco uh, Fair. Is that what it's called? They're showing animals over there, giving away thousands of dollars of scholarships. We don't even have an FFA, but we're starting one in January. And I don't know exactly how our animals are going to do, but we'll be praying about that. So in, in, as I wrap up my, converse, my part of this presentation and, and invite you to ask us questions or make comments, we just want to be clear that we're headed in the right direction. A year ago, we had five schools in danger of being closed. That list is now down to one school. And I can tell you, if you talk to anyone, if you talk to any employee in this school, if you talk to anyone in Transformation Waco, 
Dr. McDurham, any member of her board. I think I see Mrs. Hazel Rowe back there. She is a member of the Board of Directors for Transformation Waco. I apologize if I'm missing anyone else that I don't see. But we're all focused on this. And I just believe in delivering to the Waco community a public school district that exceeds all state and federal standards. Yeah, there's, there's just no excuse to not do that. And it's difficult work. It's difficult because we're a diverse community. You know, I tell people all the time, here, right here at Waco High School, we have one of the best principals in the state of Texas. I mean, you can't go far at all and find somebody who has something good to say about Mr. Ed Love. He's a good man, he's an honorable man, he's paid his dues, he's built relationships here. Right? Good, 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 good. I don't know about football, but he and I are talking about that in private. Uh, but I can tell you, my, my reason for bringing that up is that Ed Love, in his classes right now, he got a little boy in his school, his name is Neil. I'll protect his last name to protect, his, protect the innocent. His name is Neil. This kid is a star up here on this, on this stage in theater. This kid has two parents. One parent went to Texas Tech. <laughs> Another parent went to Texas a and And when you talk to Neil, you say, where are you going to school? He's like, I don't know. My mama keeps saying tech. My daddy keeps saying a and &M. I'm thinking about Baylor. <laughs> and we have hundreds of those kids. Their home atmosphere is right. Their home support is right. They came into kindergarten reading. Their parents are active on, with their teachers. But sitting right next to that little boy is a little boy named Marcus. Well, I'll give you another name that's real, Jermaine. Jermaine is, he doesn't know his father. Jermaine is 16. His mother works two jobs. She really works three jobs because she don't even count the job she does on Saturday and Sunday. Jermaine is raising himself. He has a little brother and a little sister. He can cook better than any of us can cook because he's had to, to survive. He didn't know what to do with a bunch of dry rice. Somebody had to teach him to put that in some water and boil it. Put some soy sauce in it. Trying to survive. They know how to take $20 and make it last to the end of the month. And I'm telling you, our love and commitment for Neil and Jermaine is the same. We want both of those kids to get what they deserve. And that's why we invite our community to share in the accountability of our schools. See, when we say no improvement required campuses, we don't want, the board already knows the goal. They said it. You don't have to talk to me about no improvement required. Anyone on my team will tell you that's all I talk about. But I need every parent to know. I need every member of our community to know. This is what our community deserves. This is what our kids deserve. A, a school district where every campus meets a minimum standard. Do you understand that in Midway and in Belton and some of these other places, they won't tolerate schools that are, not in, that are improvement required. They'll put a new principal in there. They'll put a whole new teacher. They'll reconstitute the teachers. Everyone. And it's not a threat. Don't get me wrong. Because as I look through the room and I see some of our instructional specialists, some of our teachers, I know for a fact these people care and work diligently every day. I'm just saying that feel the seriousness, the intensity in my voice. We will be a school district with no improvement required campuses if it's the last thing I do. We will do that. And it's, 
it's not, it's not something that we're doing for recognition, for board of the year. It's not something I'm doing because I want it for me. I want this for the Waco, Texas community. I believe in it. And we can't have inferior schools. That is savagely unequal. That when I moved here, my realtor suggested I live in Midway. There's something wrong with that. And we're working every day to change the narrative. And it starts with no improvement required campuses. What we'd like to do for the next uh, few minutes is hear from you. Um, we have an open door policy. I have people take me up on that all the time. I'm easy to get to. If you have internet access and you click on superintendent, you have my phone number, my email, and I welcome that. I'd like to thank all the employees who are here because I know that you share my enthusiasm for our goals. And it's not a strategic plan. You know, uh, Trustee Sykes has really been the biggest advocate for strategic planning. And I'm not suggesting that our bow tie is strategic planning as you've outlined it. But it's a start. And it's all about that tree. And I have people who I walk into their classroom now and they say, I ain't never seen no superintendent in a classroom. And you know what I say? Get used to it. We walk. We walk through these classrooms. And we're monitoring instruction as if our own children were sitting in those seats. And so we appreciate it. I want to thank the Office of Communications for helping us put this evening together. And I think that uh, we should open it up now for comments or questions. Anyone, we have two microphones. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> My question is about um, libraries and what role they play. I hear a lot about literacy, but never hear libraries mentioned. Um, and know from experience and from studies that well-funded and well-staffed libraries make a huge difference in literacy. Yes, ma'am. That's a great point, and for us, when we talk about the bold changes, libraries for us falls under, believe it or not now, blended learning. Now, I agree with you. For me, a library is a room with a, a caring teacher, a caring individual, one or two maybe, and a bunch of books. You know, I'm from the Cart Catalog School of Libraries. But today, you're supposed to be, you can't even go to a library today and get an encyclopedia. They don't have it. You have to be able to log up <laughs> and click and click and click and click. So our library of media services is currently being revamped under our blended learning initiative to not only provide more training and staff to our libraries, but to really beef up our libraries in a way that puts computer labs in there, internet access, and trains our teachers how to bring, you know, I want to say, hundreds of thousands of more titles and books through the effective use of technology. Uh, we're looking at providing laptops to our kids so that when they go into the library, there can be this downloading of books and information and um, where they talk to each other. So uh, the commitment for libraries couldn't be any stronger. Uh, if we're going to have a literacy plan, we obviously got to have stronger libraries. We got to have more books and we got to get kids reading. Our books have to be scaffolded. And uh, we've got fifth graders who need to be reading books that are enjoyable to them, but they're on a second grade level. We've also got fifth graders that are ready to start reading some of the classics. And so uh, differentiating our instruction through our libraries is definitely something we'll make a note to, to bring more to the public about. Good question. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Yes, ma'am. My name is Nora Mabry, and I have two kids that are gifted and child. Mm -hmm. Second and third grade. 
And a lot of times, the things they do at home, I mean, at school, they can't do it at home because I don't have the asset to help them to do it. I have asked for them to give me some of the work that they do at school so I can work with them at home. So that's to encourage them. Even though they've been in CPS custody and I have custody of them, I want them to have a better, better life. Sure. Not be pushed to the side because they have a problem. And a lot of time I don't get that answer right away. And then when you live a mother and concerned about your child being productive in life, trying to go somewhere, he's reading a fifth grade book. And I don't want him to be disencouraged when he reading. You know, even though my daughter has she's gift and talent, but she's not as fast as he is. And she get upset and frustrated. A lot of time I feel like they don't have to tie the food with that child. And I want to get the, the skill stuff to help them so they can be productive in this. Yes, ma'am. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. And just like the question on libraries, uh, how we can help kids outside of school is a question we really want to answer. And we're trying to come up with more technology where we put it in the hands of kids. Uh, we're trying to come up with more programs that allow kids to be more responsible for their learning. And if we can get to the point where kids can learn anytime, anywhere, that's the new standard. Anytime, anywhere, a kid is supposed to be able to help themselves become better readers. Um, I have, I have, we have our math coordinator here, secondary math coordinator, and she says any kid that's gifted in mathematics can learn even if they don't speak English. Uh, I didn't believe her when she first said that, but when you go study the research, that's true. And so it really comes back to quality instruction, and uh, we definitely want to get with you on your kid and see if we can come up with some campus-specific plans to help you help your child. We applaud your, your efforts. Any other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. South Waco. Thank you. My name is Monica Jackson, and I'm the mom of the Waco High Lion. Yeah. And my little lion prior on Steve. I would like to thank the board for the opportunity for students to have dual credit uh, opportunities. My son started dual credit at 13 years old last year, and I was kind of nervous. Like, should a 13 year old be taking college classes? <laughs> But it gives us the opportunity to help them before they go to college on things they should know how to do. Um, he's in his fourth class, he's taking two classes this semester, doing well, um, and it's a, it's a great opportunity um, for people who, you know, some people that can just easily pay for college tuition, and other, other folks, you know, we're thinking about it, we say that the cost of college education is skyrocketing, and so, to have that available to parents is an awesome opportunity for our students and a great opportunity for our students. Thank you, Ms. Evans. I appreciate that. And just so we're clear, uh, we're having to educate our parents about this opportunity. You understand? I'm talking about they get to take dual credit classes at MCC for free, which my CFO would say, no, it's not free. <laughs> There's a hefty check. Uh, being cut for every one of those classes. But this last year, two kids graduated from WISD high schools, and the day before they graduated from us, they graduated from MCC with associate's degrees. This year, that number goes from two kids to 50. The next year, it goes from 50 to 150. People start hearing, what do you mean you can go to MCC and get an associate's degree for free? Starting in the ninth grade. Now your grades gotta be right. You gotta have parent support. Miss, Miss Evans, she, she not just putting them in dual credit, oh, you get it, you get it. No, you gotta work with these kids because it's college level coursework. But here in the 21st century, that's the new standard. Dual credit while you're in on the school board's done. 
And think about how that sets kids up. We have a kid right now that graduated with her associate's degree. She's 17, and she's a junior at Texas A&M University. She's fixing to graduate with a mechanical engineering degree. She won't be 21 years old. All because her and her family decided to take advantage of the wonderful course offerings provided in the Waco ISD. You can't get that in other public school districts, not all of them. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, so I have uh, two kids at Lake Air Monster. All right. Uh, had a great experience there. We, we love it. Um, uh, we live in the Brookview uh, Elementary uh, neighborhood, and I think if if I um, could go back several years, I might send my kids to Brookview. Um, but we've been at Lake Air for several years now. Um, but I I drive around my neighborhood, and the Brookview neighborhood. A neighborhood that should be going to Brookview, and I see lots of signs for other schools yeah. in their in their yards. And you mentioned competition, and I wonder if you think about how we bring back some of those families into Waco ISD, or if that's something that comes as the school district changes over the years, or how you think about that? Well, that's an excellent question, and I want to be clear, on behalf of our board, uh, we consider it every kid personal. And if they choose to go to Harmony, parents might say, well, it's just closer to a, no, 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 you hurt my feelings. I have an issue with that, I have an issue with that. And really, like, that's one of the reasons why we capitalize on talking about things like dual credit. Because if you want to take dual credit in some of these private schools, you can do it, but you got to pay. That's the difference. So uh, we absolutely uh, have a plan for the record. And I hate that most of our media has left. For the record, our attendance, our enrollment in grades 6 through 12 is up. 200 kids. Now, I don't mind telling you, it's down about 300 kids at K through 5. And that's them houses, that's them signs you see in everyone's yard. But uh, at secondary, people starting to wake up and say, you can get what at Waco High? And we can show you. This is open records requestable. <laughs> Got to be careful about saying that because I usually get took up on my challenge. But you can open records request right now. We got kids coming from Riker. Kids coming from Vanguard, kids coming from Harmony, and all of them are saying, we want what you're selling at Waco High or University High or Brazos. And so it's a tough fight, but public, public education, very respectfully, is under attack. And uh, people see our kids as these beautiful little children carrying a backpack full of cash. They don't care nothing about the kid. They just want that cash that's in the backpack. So I'm not here to tell you how to vote. Uh, that's not the purpose of this meeting. But go vote, <laughs> like I did today. <laughs> and think about you know, people who want to push vouchers, people who want to push uh, more charters and more private schools. Don't get me wrong. You know, We feel like we've come up with a charter system that's the best of both worlds. Has a wonderful board, has a wonderful CEO, and our board and myself will tell you, we're just like this. We're working on the work together. And we need more people to come to the table and say, how can we help? So it's a good thing, but now what, what Waco ISD is in need of, and we have one of the best communications departments in the state, uh, without question, Kyle DeBeer, has built himself a reputation for being calm and smooth uh, when it comes to dealing with media and community engagement. Uh, having said that, we need a marketing campaign. 
We need to get people to believe in what we're selling. And boy, I know some of the teachers and principals. If I could just put some of them up. Like when you say Brookview, do you mean Crestview? Oh, sorry. I meant Crestview. Best principal we got. One of them anyway. Six foot, seven inch <laughs> doctoral student at Baylor University. Leads praise and worship at his church on Sunday. And he's the principal at Crestview Elementary. So um, that's an example. We have wonderful people in this school system. Wonderful people. We just got to market ourselves better. Please help me uh, introduce Mr. Jacob Donnell, the principal at Crestview. <laughs> now, you know, people that want to go to Lake Air, you know, that's going to always be, it's going to always have a waiting list, I sense. <laughs> but uh, for the record, one of the reasons why we talk about no improvement required campuses is because there has to be a standard where, look, even if you go to Crestview, your kid's going to get this. It can't be that they're getting this at Lake Air and they're getting this at Crestview. And so equity is our battle cry. We got time for a couple more questions and then I believe the board and I will stick around. Uh, please feel free to contact me uh, via the internet or phone. Um, we work for you. And I really want to be the type of superintendent that's known for being accessible. No, you see me at football games or choir concerts or band contests. I was meeting today with the fine arts director and we were talking about how one of our schools in the marching band contest got a two and the other one got a one. I want y'all to know that conversation was just as intense as the conversation I have with our head football coaches about only winning one or two games. We're only going to do that one year. We're not going to do that two years in a row. Or else I'll get some more people in there. Because our kids, if we push them, they can be competitive. I don't care if we're talking about golf or if we're talking about SAT. If we push them, then they will rise to our expectations. So I push them like I push my own kids. So any other comments or questions before we wrap up this time together. We have two more meetings, both on Mondays, one next Monday at the Multipurpose Center, and then the following Monday we'll be at Bells Hills Elementary. That presentation will be in Spanish. Se habla español. I'd like to thank Mr. Love and the awesome hospitality at Waco High School for having us tonight. I'd like to thank my Mr. DeBeer uh, and his team for being here tonight to help us set all up the PowerPoint and the content and making all this happen. And I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. We really hope that we get to the point where we have a town hall meeting and there's three or 400 people in the room, all here talking about what we can do to help our kids. But until then, We'll be very thankful for just having you join us and know that anything we can do, this school district's going to improve. We're going to continuously get better until we create a school system that everyone in this city can be proud to proclaim they live in Waco, Texas, home of the Waco Public Schools. Thank you. Yeah, it's not.